Welcome back. Welcome to Karen's Couch. I'm so glad that you decided to tune back in and join us because today's episode is going to be really insightful and really informative. I feel really, um, I feel really cozy about this interview because we've gone all the way over to Switzerland to a, uh, an amazing woman who has become an author herself. She's got an incredible story, an amazing message, but most of all, she's very true to what we're all about here on Karen's Couch, and that is diving deep into your unanswered questions and really revealing a person's own individual truth. Now, in keeping with the theme of the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about depression. And as you know, if you've watched the other videos and the other, the other sessions and listened to the podcasts, you'd know that we've spoken with a handful of experts about depression and what it is and how do we diagnose it and how do we even know if we've, if we've got depression. So today, I've actually got somebody on whose name is Jane Newman, all the way over from Switzerland, as I said. And Jane is somebody who's been through her own personal journey that's been quite extraordinary, and I can't wait for her to tell you all about it. But it sounds to me also that Jane is still in the process of the journey, like we all are. And I think that's the part that I find most compelling about the brief chat that I've had with Jane already and also doing research on her background. She's just like us. You know, Jane's not somebody who's unique or different or un unusual. She's just a normal person just like us, experiencing all the ups and downs and highs and lows of life. So please join me in welcoming the beautiful Jane Newman to Karen's Couch. Jane, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day, for joining us here and sharing your journey with us. Thank you. I know it means a lot and it's, you know, it's, it's, sometimes it's quite challenging. You're welcome. Oh, it's a pleasure. And sometimes it can be quite challenging to share your own journey in depth. So we're very grateful that you're willing to do that and prepared to do that with us. So Jane, I yes, guess... Yeah. I guess what I really want to do is I want to start off by asking you about depression. What's, what is your view on what depression, like what's been your experience of depression, yours personally? Well, I'm glad you said me personally, Karen, because as you probably know from your previous um, uh, interviews and your own experience, there are many kinds of depression. Um, and I don't feel competent to um, talk about all of them. Mine was of the kind of a real um, strong, strong um, pathological anxiety, which meant that even breakfast was a challenge for me, which normally I can do more or less in my sleep. So that, that was, everything worried me. Everything, it kind of made me freeze up, you know, mm. um, instead of being able to be flexible um, I just didn't know how to cope with deciding what we would eat for breakfast, for lunch, for tea, which are such ordinary everyday things. And, um, okay, no big deal, you might think, if you've never been there. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah, a mountain. Jane, when did this happen? So how did, how did you know? Like, w w did something happen? Did you have a, a, a trauma or did it just you know, raise its ugly head, had it been there all along? Share with us how you actually discovered that you were suffering with something. Okay, yes, I'll try to do it like when I was back then, <laughs> um, early 30s, two children. Right. Um, I had lost a colleague, a very close colleague, so there was that bereavement. Uh, we were in a job of high stress in Africa. My husband was a director, he was often gone. And on top of that, I had three um, goes of malaria, the falciparum kind, which is in, in your head. And uh, this sent, um, well, there's the side effects of the medication. And one of them was that I was having terrible nightmares and not sleeping. And if you put that together, well, I didn't know that at the time, so I won't say it yet. But anyway, yes, I just came to a halt, a bit like a car that, you know, suddenly start slowing down and stops and you think well, what's going on what's going on you're totally out of control um that's how it happened 
So it wasn't one particular event. It was, I guess, it sounds to me like a collection of things coupled with grief that put you into a state where you felt that it was mm. tough living inside of your own skin. Is that right? Yes, I definitely tough living inside my own skin. I, I think I just felt desperate. Uh, what do you do when you wake up in the morning and you can't even cope with breakfast? I mean, it's just, and then you still got the rest of the day and you can't face people anymore. And I'm living in an, a, a, a sort of a center with lots of apartments. So the minute I open my apartment door there, I meet people on the staircase. Yeah. So, um, and my husband's the director, so that made me the wife of the director. Yeah. That's a scary place to be when people look up to you. <laughs> so did that happen gradually for you? I mean, it, did, it, no. or did you just wake up one morning, so the day before you were a normal person functioning in society, and then the next day you woke up and all of a sudden that reality was removed from you? Or did it happen in a gradual phase where it got worse and worse each day? It probably was somewhat gradual, but right. without me recognizing what was going on. You know, when you struggle with loss of sleep, um, of course you tighten up um, and you become less efficient. And so, but you know, I don't remember that clearly anymore, but the, the gradual process, but I do remember that it was fairly sudden that I just, yeah, I lost it. So what did you do? when you started to feel that you were losing it, what was the first thing that you did? Well, I cried. <laughs> I bet and, you did. Um, I bet you did. <laughs> and um, my husband took me to the doctor, our family doctor, who, yeah. in Abidjan, where we were living in, in Ivory Coast, who was a wonderful man, such a wonderful man. Yeah. Um, and he put me on antidepressants, you know, after talking with me. And I didn't really, I didn't really care what he put me on, quite honestly. I didn't even think about antidepressants, not antidepressants. I just said, give it to me. I'll take it, anything. <laughs> you were just looking for some relief, really. I was really, I, I use in my book the picture of a drowning person. You know, when you're drowning, you stick your hand up for help. You know, when your head's already under the water, if someone takes your hand and pulls you out, you don't care whether it's a pirate. You're taking it. You're taking it. Yeah. And you take the other things later down the line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that, I, you know, I so, I can so resonate with you in that sensation and that feeling of just pure desperation and just somebody give me something. And I know mm. that the people who are listening and watching this particular mm. episode they're going to resonate and if not for themselves for people that you know you know mm, mm. so so you went to the doctor they prescribed antidepressants you yeah. jumped at it with both arms did you find yeah. that it gave you the relief that you were expecting it would give you i think it definitely helped but yeah. um it wasn't enough um, and so at a certain point, um, my husband, who was absolutely wonderful um, for the, the whole 18 months until we could go on leave, which is a long time. Yeah. And then I knew I could get psychotherapy. But in the, in the intermediate time, at some point, my husband got up one morning. He said, I can't go on anymore. We've got to go find help. And so we went, and I said, well, I don't know who to go to. He said, well, I can think of one missionary couple that I know and have great respect for. Let's go to them. And the wife was a doctor. We went to them, and she said, look, I've never dealt with anybody with depression, but, you know, we'll just trust God, and we'll just see what comes out. And actually, she put her finger on the major interior issue that I had on top of all the exterior things that came on me and caused the crash but there was something underlying within my way of functioning um which can you know contributed greatly to why i was there hmm. so i'm very keen to explore that with you but before we go there i just want to i just want to really dive a little bit deeper into um, when your husband said i can't go on anymore mm. what was happening what was happening from his perspective that he was witnessing and participating in that he thought, I can't do this anymore? Because a lot of times, 
you know, when somebody is suffering with something, whether it's depression or a physical illness that's expressed outwardly, generally the people in our lives are also significantly impacted. What was he suffering Very with? Very much. Yeah, and I think that's a big part that we don't, we don't <laughs> give enough credence to. What was, what was he going through? Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up, Karen, because that's one of the reasons I also wrote my book. Yeah. Um, he had to get to the place where, you know, he's a fixer, like I was telling you earlier. He mends things very well, mm. but he couldn't mend me. And yeah. I think that was the huge mountain for him to get over and accept. I can't heal Jane, but I can support her. Yeah. And he was marvelous in that. But, you know, when things go on, and he, you have to remember he was carrying heavy responsibility. He was young. He was 34, 35. Yeah. Um, and on top of that, he was basically running the home as well. Wow. With me not being able to take any initiative. Um, and it just got too much. And he just said, you know, the, the medication is helping a bit, but we just need more. Yeah. So mm. let's go to that. Let's speak to that a little bit more. You mentioned that obviously there was a lot of external factors that were compounding. Yes. But you said internally yes. there was something that was a little bit broken, that this missionary couple was able to put their finger definitely. on. What was yes, that? Definitely. What was it? <laughs> Burying my reactions and emotions. And that's going to be my lifetime's work. I mean, I'm hugely better at not doing that <laughs> where I am today obviously after 29 years <laughs> so what does that mean what does that mean burying your emotions and i guess i was totally out of touch with what i was really feeling and um as i talked with this couple i realized that that came from my childhood firstly in my family where you you didn't have problems they didn't exist um so it's not surprising that my mum also had a very major, long-lasting depression. Oh, is um, that right? But then, yes. Um, and the other thing was that I was at a boarding school between ages 7, 17, and I was just so unhappy there. Right. Missing my parents who were out in Africa, but they were not missionaries. Um, and I just, my way of coping was to say, I've got to put on a brave front mm. you know mom and dad are doing this for my good to give me a good education and so I just pushed it all down inside me I did a lot of crying yeah. alone at night yeah had a lot of sleepless nights but everybody else thought I was a winner you know it's amazing that and a lot of people who do suffer with depression whether it's clinical or situational um, they tend to have a very you know a, a very stoic uh, you know uh, way of portraying themselves outside so that yeah. they don't affect everybody around them. But the one thing that's very common or it seems to be a common thread, and, and I'm very interested to hear your perspective on this, with people that I've dealt with over the many years from a psychological perspective, is that when we go through depression, we become very disconnected from the self. And mm. usually it comes from some sort of experience, and perhaps in your case it was being in boarding school and trying to reconcile with yourself why you were there but still being away from the stability of the family home but sure. then trying to justify it by saying well they're doing this for my own good I should be happy I should be glad and each time yes, you, I, each time I we do that I went as far as saying I should be glad but I should make the most of it definitely <laughs> or, or appreciative or appreciative of, of yeah, you know what yeah. they've yeah and each time we do that I think we disconnect from what the real yeah. self is actually crying out for. Did, was, do you think yeah. that was similar for you? Definitely, and I carried that over into my adult life, but it didn't come out until my husband became director of the work we were involved in, and when he was absent a lot, and those absences triggered oh. unconsciously, of course, memories Absolutely. of the absence with my parents, and I found them terrible and I think the reason that the bereavement of my colleague affected me so much was that he and his wife used to hold me up when my husband was traveling yeah. and then suddenly they were gone. <laughs> so it's almost like just a continual reoccurrence of a sensation of abandonment almost. 
Yeah. From when you were in boarding so. school and then your colleagues and your husband being away, it's like this onslaught. And not ex not choosing it, not accepting it, you see, because yeah. if you don't recognize it, how can you accept it? Yeah, that's true. Awareness is everything, isn't it? Yeah. So you went yeah. on the antidepressants um, as yeah. a way of coping. You met the missionary couple and they helped you to start to become aware of what was Absolutely. going on for you. Mm. So what, yeah. did, what did that do to your um, experience of depression from that point forward? How did that change the experience for you in any way? It definitely put me on a very gradual, slow, but upward path. I definitely felt a spark of hope after that. And I also felt that there was something I could do. Of course, I failed many times <laughs> in recognizing that I was varying, but I, I started to count the times I succeeded rather than the times I failed. <laughs> nice work, nice work. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Uh, it really, I think it sustained me until we could get back to Switzerland and get um, expert psychotherapist yeah. help. Yeah. And so when you took on the psychotherapy coupled with the antidepressants, because from a psychological perspective, um, most psychologists will suggest that the combination of you know, cognitive mm. behavioral therapy and antidepressants is probably one of the most successful treatments yeah. for depression. Amen. Amen, she says. <laughs> and I guess that's probably why you would write a book that's titled, Thank God for Antidepressants, because you seem to have a very spiritual connection to um, antidepressants, your experience and a higher power. Tell us about that a bit. Hmm. Um, well, I guess, you know, I, I burnt my boats and went to Africa as a missionary to be involved in Bible translation work, which is a fairly all-embracing thing to do. Um, no doubt, no doubt. I guess, um, of course, in every level of one's life, including the spiritual, you know, there's this awkwardness when you have a crash. And it took me many years, I think, um, although in those first years, I already started to learn that God loved me just as I was, that I didn't need to be all together. Mm. And that, that just was amazing. And suddenly, after a few years... Oh, and it looks like we've got some technical problems there, Jane. So you might have to repeat what you're saying if you can hear me. Um, we will yeah. fix this. It will fix itself. Don't worry. We've had an amazing yes, connection up until now. So don't worry. Those higher powers, they want your voice. <laughs> <laughs> trust it. Trust it. <laughs> <laughs> so please. I do. I do. <laughs> so please, Jane, we just lost you right at the part where um, you said that you'd gone and become a missionary and it was all encompassing. So if you could start from there again, that would be great. Yes, yeah, so I was saying that it's like burning your boats. Huh? You, you leave your job, you leave everything, and you go. Wow. Um, but I was saying that the, it's the same in the spiritual realm as with the physical realm. When you go through a really difficult time or a crash like I did, it takes a while to work your way to the place where it's somehow... Um, all it, it's incorporated in all aspects of your life. So it took me a while to realize that God's, uh, the way God saw me hadn't changed because I'd crashed. But the way so, you saw yourself had changed. Yes, and the way I saw God had changed. Of course, how can <laughs> it not? How can that because not? Because I, I suddenly realized that I was loved, even if I wasn't efficient, even if I wasn't useful, in my terms, of course. Yeah, of course. Later on, I discovered that actually I could be very useful being vulnerable. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. What a beautiful statement, Jane. You know, I think that's probably one of the most powerful statements. Depression aside, mm -hmm. our greatest mm -hmm. power lies in our willingness and our ability to be vulnerable. Because it's only, in that, it's only from that place that we can create 
And for those that mm. do have either a religious or a spiritual connotation to their lives, you know, it's not only are we able to create, but we're able to co-create with absolutely th with the grander yeah. force that beats our heart, breathes us, blinks our eyes, blooms a rose, and bakes a baby. You know, and that's a statement that I often <laughs> I often refer wow. to that. You know, I want that one in writing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I, comes from down under. I think that there's a real common thread in that. Whether we call that God or universal intelligence or innate intelligence, I think that there is a, there is a power grander than the human. I mean, otherwise, how did we even get here? And this show is not going to go down that path. But trust me, viewers and listeners, we are doing that one day. Um, OK, I'll be back. <laughs> that sounds great. That sounds great. But I think the most fascinating thing that you said there is that, you know, in your vulnerability, you found yourself. And in your vulnerability, you realized that you were loved. And I guess when we realize that we are loved, especially when we're going through such an internally challenging journey, yeah. loving ourselves for yeah. what we're going through, rather than loving ourselves in spite of what we're going through, but loving ourselves mm. for it and embracing the experience and embracing the journey so that then we can become more because of it is always an invitation that's available to us, yet very rarely do we see life's challenges that way and then accept that invitation. Generally, what we'll tend to do is push against it, fight against it, and wish that it wasn't happening. I've done that too. <laughs> and welcome to the human race, I say. <laughs> you know, when we do that though, we really miss the opportunity to experience the gift because the experience is happening. We can't pretend it's not. And, you know, you're a classic example of that. It, it, it has occurred. We can't say it didn't. Look, you, you're living proof that that's been yeah. your journey. So, so now what? Where are we now? So we've got the book. I, I, and I really want to hear more about the book. But I really want to hear about your, your, your experiences now. Um, how are you now? How are you... How are you surviving your life right now or thriving through your life right now? What's life like for you? I think thriving is a better word yes. for now, um, especially since 2010, which was a fairly cataclysmic year. I call it the worst and the best year of my life. Oh, wow. Um, where I realized I needed to change antidepressants because um, at, at one stage I did manage to stopped the antidepressants and I lived about 10 years without them. Oh, that's, um, that's huge. But then I crashed again, right. even though I vowed to myself I never would. <laughs> but there was more stuff, you know, that needed to be dealt with and, and it was also a, a, a very challenging situation. Um, Can you elaborate but, on that at all for us, just so that our listeners and our viewers have a perspective? Yes, I mean, it's something everybody can relate to yeah. I mean but basically really heavy um, personal life with four children having come back from Africa and trying to settle into a Europe that had moved on um, and which we had to try and understand including the church scene we didn't feel at all at one with the church scene <laughs> they'd moved on you know hugely um, our children were struggling in school so there was all that personal side there was heavy work um, and then we moved house and this was literally one day to the next one day my husband and I were cleaning the old the place we'd moved out of and we were having a great time we it was such a wonderful time for the two of us working together on cleaning the house and we were laughing and the next day I was a basket case it was shattering wow. totally shattering and then I just couldn't Again, I was back in that, that prison of anxiety, you know, that just keeps you there and you just can't face breakfast again. What does the medical, what does the medical fraternity suggest is actually occurring for you? What does is, what is your doctor say is actually happening for you? Do they say it's the chemical imbalance? What's their view on what you're experiencing? Yes, they, yes. Uh, finally, that was in 2010, and that's one of the ingredients that made it the best year of my life, right. one of many, <laughs> right. was that I had a great psychiatrist by accident. She was replacing one that I would normally have got, but we clicked, 
um, she was just wonderful, um, and she she gave me so much respect as a person. Beautiful. Um, she took seriously the fact that I wanted to change antidepressants because of the side effects of the one that I'd been on for about 12 years. Mm. And she said, no, we... Oh, what a shame. We've lost... To find something. But it took us six months, and yeah. I had nothing... She just gave me stuff to help me sleep, basically. Jane, we've got you back. Keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I was just saying that, um, yes, the psychiatrist really wanted to help me to and she find gave, something, but it, yep, she gave and we you did something find something. Yeah. She gave me something to sleep, um, but still, every day was an immense battle. But wow. this is something I mentioned in my book, that what, what helped me survive, yes, my faith in God and God himself more than my faith, I have to say. <laughs> um, and her, she helped me, faithful husband, you know, all these things are so important. Um, but she said to me, you know, Jane, you're surviving because of all that you've learned through psychotherapy yeah. and all the changes that have happened. See, I condemn myself. I said, you obviously haven't learned a thing. You know, you should be able to do without antidepressants now. <laughs> wow. And um, she said, no. And then she explained to me um, about uh, what it is, and she said, you know, if you lack serotonin and also noradrenaline, yep. which is a hormone, mm. um, she said it's a, it's a chemical imbalance in your brain, and we can observe it. She says, I don't feel I need to in your case, but she says, I, I have patients in clinics, and we can observe before treatment, during and after, and we mm. can see changes. And suddenly I thought, it's something real, it's not just, well, I'm pointing at my head because it is in my brain, but it's not just in my thinking. Yeah, you um, didn't make it up. You're not, I didn't make it you're up. You're not pretending. I don't, need just, I don't need just a kick in the behind, you know? Um, <laughs> Do you know that's, that's what you say in Australia? <laughs> that, that's ex and that's exactly what we say, only we're not quite so polite. But um, I in think, the <laughs> and a little less polite than even that. Um, <laughs> but I think what the point that you raise is really important because you know a lot of people out in society actually look at those that are suffering with depression, especially mm. when it's long term, and tend to think that all that's required is a boot in the butt and what's wrong with you, get on with it, it's all made up. And because you don't have cuts and bruises and bashes and you know, an external exactly. illness that people can relate to, they think it's not real. And I guess even we think that it's not real. So we even go through that own, our own struggle with it. What's been, sure. what's been some of the, the challenges that you've experienced being on antidepressants over a long period of time? And I guess, you know, has there been judgment? Have you found that there's been a stigma? I mean, have, have, have people responded to you differently? Has that had any impact on you at all? Please say no. <laughs> uh, I, I got over it and faced it and it doesn't bother me at all now. I couldn't care less. But oh, nice. um, that, you know, it takes time to get to a place like that. Oh. Um, and, and I have to say, I know of friends who have suffered a lot, who have lost jobs um, and so on. Um, and I have to say that mostly I have been very, very lucky. Mm. Um, friends have continued to treat me as normal. However, having said that, I played, in a, I played tennis for our town for quite a number of years. And my tennis team, who are great friends, but I know that sometimes they were talking, you know, those hushed tones when you're talking about the D or the AD word, mm. and you suddenly hear and the conversation changes, and you know, you just know. Um, mm. You know, there's the politically correct, which I hate. I try never to do politically correct. Um, but, you know, people will say certain things to you to your face, but behind your back, they'll say other things. Yeah. And um, that's something I did occasionally come across. But again, I'm relatively fortunate. 
Then I did have some people within the Christian context, and I say this not to do down Christians or the church or Buddhists sure. or any, I guess any religious person um, might um, say something like this, but you know, one person said to me, well, haven't you prayed? <laughs> and you know, you sort of, oh, you know, yes, many times. <laughs> Then you say, well, actually, I've got to the place where I just leave it up to God. You know, if he wants to heal me, he'll do it. But I have a whole chapter in my book about the vet subject of healing because, you know, some people do recover, don't need antidepressants. Some need them long term and yeah. whether they have some kind of faith or not. But, you know, what do we mean? In, certainly in, a, in a, a situation where people pray, when they pray for your healing, what are they praying for? And I really went deeply into that um, yeah. in the last few years. And, and you know, I, I feel totally at peace. And I just say to them, you know, God has healed me of so many things through the experience of depression. Oh, I, wow. I don't really mind about being on antidepressants. Of course, life would be easier when you travel, you don't have to remember to take them with you or if you forget them ring your pharmacist to fax the nearest pharmacist, you know, to so you can have a prescription. But no big deal for me. You know, Jane, uh, and it's just such a shame that we've come to the end of our time slot, but, you know, I think that you're a wonderful example of somebody who has, you know, recognised and become very self-aware of what's going on for you You've sought mm. the help that you've needed. You've found your own solutions, which then has you live your own very fulfilled life and a, and a life sure. that, no doubt, just even from this interview, a life that's leaving a legacy for others, which I think is just so commendable. I, re I take my hat yeah. off to you. And it's such Thank a... Thank you. <laughs> It's, it, it really is, it's a really amazing um, journey and, and for me personally to have met you because there are a lot of people out there, in, you know, for our listeners and our viewers, yeah. you may know people who have suffered with depression and who are not saying anything. They're not doing anything about it. They're living underneath mm. the cloak of silence when it comes to the way that they're feeling. And, you know, there is so much help out there nowadays and there's such the lid has been lifted on depression where we're no mm. longer um suffering with the stigma that depression used to have because now we're starting to understand it more we're starting to relate to it more and we also have solutions which i think mm. is just beautiful and amazing that you jane have found a long-term solution that has really worked for you granted it's been one hell of a journey <laughs> but what you've gotten out of it along the way it's been worth it yeah and i yes. always say nothing is for nothing everything happens for a reason it doesn't matter okay. what it is there is purpose mm. and perfection in every experience provided we go looking for it the only time sure. something's a mistake is when we make it a mistake and i think mm. that's a real message that you jane are the epitome of so thank mm. you Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. You're welcome, Karen. Now, Jane, if our listeners want to, um, and our viewers want to hear more about you or get their hands on a copy of your book, where can we find you? Um, I have an author page, uh, both with Amazon, although people aren't using that much, but with Facebook in English. I have one in French, one in English. The English one just has my name, Jane Newman. Right. And um, the book you can get through Amazon and down under you have other retailers, you know, online. Okay. Um, there you go. Awesome. Um, those are the main places. All right. Well, wonderful. Well, we're actually, for our listeners and our viewers, we're going to have two copies of Jane's book. Now, Jane's book is called Thank God for Antidepressants. Definitely, I think it's going to, I'm going to love it. I'm going to sit down and just devour that book because I think it's going to be really insightful to see somebody else's journey that's found their own personal solution and fulfillment as a result of their own experiences. 
So we're going to have two copies to give away of Thank God for Antidepressants. So the way that you guys can get your hands on those giveaways is to post your comments on the bottom of this video on this website page telling us about why you think this book would be particularly valuable to you. So you have to do that in 25 words or less. How about that? If you want to get a copy of the book, that's all that you have to do. Jane, thank you so much for joining us here on Karen's Couch. It's been an absolutely wonderful conversation and I feel like I've made myself a new girlfriend along the way. So hopefully we'll be able to get you back on the couch later on and be able to do some updates with you. So thank you so much. You're welcome, Karen. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, and you, and you. God bless. God bless. <laughs> Bye. And for all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us here once again on Karen's Couch, where we dive deep into your unanswered questions. Join us here again next week. Make sure that you go to our Facebook page, comment on all of our social media. We always want to know your feedback. And there's one other thing I want to ask you guys to do this week. When you go to our social media pages, so if it's Facebook, it's all the W's dot Facebook dot com forward slash Karen's Couch. Jump onto that page and let us know topics that you'd like us to discuss. Karen's Couch is all about diving deep into your unanswered questions with the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So tell us what you want us to talk about. Give us some ideas and our production team will get stuck into it straight away for you. So join us here again next week. Don't miss an episode. It's all about you. I'm going to see you on the couch. Bye for now.